Praise the Lord. I had family over this weekend. Now, <laughs> for me to have family over is a miracle. You know, it's like, wow, what a big deal. Because most of my life, my family really hasn't been a part of my life. My sisters, as much as I love them, God bless them, really haven't been out of their way to visit me in my life. You know, I usually was the one as the older brother to come visit them in their life. But once in a blue moon, my one sister, Mary Lynn Chickadee, she goes out of her way to visit, you know, and that sometimes happens maybe once a, you know, a couple, two or three years or whatever, because we don't really spend that much time together. And some people don't understand that. But you see, when I was growing up in the Lord, you know, I got saved when I was just out of high school. And I witnessed to my family, you know, and for quite a few years when they were going through some tough stuff, you know, I was still trying to help them with what comfort God, the God of all comfort, had given me. You know, trying to encourage them and in most ways really discouraging them because for the early part of my life, I was always about salvation. And until they got saved, you know, I was always on their case. And so they really didn't like me very much. And, you know, God planned that out before I was even born because I was always treated in my childhood as an only child in a family of four, which doesn't mean that my mother spent all this time with me. It meant that my mother spent most of her time with my sisters because they were, after all, women. And... There was no real man in the household, so me, you know, I was always told that, you know, I was off doing something, you know, and gone somewhere or some other place. And the amazing thing is, is that, you know, when I look at and have talked to people that were around at the time, I recognized and realized, you know, that it was, of course, my mother did the best that she could, but she was like, I tell people, the best father I had. <laughs> you know, as a mother, eh, you know, she's okay. You know, and... My sister liked to think that, you know, well, we all have different perspectives. Well, yeah, but God brings wisdom to those perspectives if you're willing to accept what he's done in your life from the beginning you were born to the moment you die. God, it says in the book of Psalms, sets the solitary in the family. And for me, that's what he did. I was an only child, so to speak, because God had set me apart to look at things differently to understand and comprehend the human condition that when I got saved, God would allow me to pull from those experiences that he had prepared me for from the beginning of the time that I was conceived to the moment that I actually lay my head down in rest from this physical body that I live in because God wanted to use me in some ways, even like today. And God did the same with you. Did you know that you were not an accident? You know, some people would say, oh, well, you're a bastard. Well, yeah, I am, actually, but not just because I was born by my mother's illegitimate, you know, uh, messing around, but because, you know, my attitude. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> That's a joke. Come on. Let's get real. No, I was born out of marriage, you know, so yeah, I'm, I'm considered a bastard son, you know, that, no, my father, you know, was like, hey, it was just kind of one of those things, you know, that she was on the back of a motorcycle and, boy, the guy about beat her to death, you know, and they had whatever they had, and I was born. And so it wasn't quite exactly, you know, like the planned out thing that, you know, kind of happened, but I didn't get aborted either. <laughs> I was around. And the amazing thing was is that even on my birth certificate, they wanted to put bastard. But unfortunately, or fortunately, my mother managed to get them to put down my father's name as opposed to writing down bastard or out of wedlock. You know. In those days, they used to do that. So... The amazing thing was that God planned this all out. So in your life, he has planned out your experiences, your reason for living, the purpose of your life, which God has determined before you were even born how you would be in life. And so when my family visited, I was thrilled to see them. You know, it's like when they come visit me, I like to see them face to face. You know, my sister says, well, you never call. True, I don't. I don't call my sisters, I don't call my family, I don't get on the phone and call up people. You see, I spent a lot of years as a, well, network engineer, but then also as a, before I was that, I, I was a, a phone 
you say phone counselor, but it really was talk center, you know, or counseling in the sense of selling things or, you know, being that telephone solicitor, you know, that you, you get when he calls you up, you know, a cold call out of nowhere, you know, what? You want what? And you hang up on him. Well, I was one of those kind of people, and I was good at it, you know, very good. You know, I could, I could adapt to the person immediately because I just used the gifts of the Spirit that, you know, maybe should have been used for the kingdom of heaven, but I was using them for the kingdom of man, you know, so I was kind of good at it, you know, and man, I always got promoted, but after a while I realized how phony it was talking on the phone and how you could be lying about whatever it was you were going through and never once be truthful on the phone. But face to face I began to see things, you know, I could identify what a person was feeling or their emotions. I could be with them in one spirit and one truth, you know, sharing and communicating God. So I would always go to that person whenever I would hear that they were in trouble on the phone. I would go visit my family. And sure enough, there was a difference in being face to face. And so this weekend, my sister visited, and it was wonderful, you know, to see because she came with her husband and with my one of my nephews, and you know, he had grown up, and you know, I don't know much about my nieces and nephews except that, you know, at some point in time I had to choose between family and ministry, you know. Well, yeah, I love my family and I pray for them and I've committed them unto the Lord, you know, and done all that I can in the ministry, you know, to share with them the best that I can give to them. But then I also had that time where I had to say, who is my family? You know, those that do the will of God, because my family has their own relationships to deal with. Some of them in God and some of them outside of God. So when the Lord took me into ministry, you know, and took me away from my family, I committed my family unto him. Even my sister, you know, who I visited with, you know, she's got a dynamic ministry going, you know, in Climate Falls, Oregon, you know, this library that's downtown, just full of books. I mean, thousands of books, you know, free to borrow, to use. And believe me, pastors come and use them. Sometimes people come too, you know, and they happen to be passing by and they wonder what's in there, you know. They, they go in this little narrow kind of like niche cranny thing, you know, like you'd see in some kind of like, you know, book barn, you know how you just kind of go in those little shops, you know, and suddenly you go in and wow, there's books everywhere. That's the way the library is. Free. Kind of like a, used to be like a uh, Firefighters for Christ library, you know. Well, it's bigger than that now. It's its own library. And this ministry my sister's been doing for a long time, you know. And before that, my mother did it. And it's like a family tradition, you know, to freely you've received, freely give. So she handles all of that. You know, takes care of it provides for it, ministers through it, you know, and isn't counseling or anything, but really just opening the doors and letting people borrow the books. And then, of course, cataloging them and trying to take care of it the best way she knows how. And I stay out of that, you know, so she would do it her way with her relationship with God. Because if I did it my way, it would be my relationship with God. So the expression of the library is her joyful ministry to the body of Christ that God has given her and allowed her the opportunity to touch people's lives in a way she might not do directly like I do right now, touching you, you know, and sharing the truth of God. But she touches people's lives by giving them books, you know, that they can be ministered to. And believe me, with all the variety of books that are there, wow, man, everybody's got something to read there. And it's really kind of neat, you know, when you see your own family member growing and maturing, you know, in the Lord. You know, I I was concerned, so I expressed some things to them, you know, and their responses blessed me, you know, I, I thought of John, you know, you know John, you know, the disciple Jesus loved, well, in 1 John, he said, I rejoice in that my children walk in truth, and that he wrote 1 John, he said, young men, you know, do this, and old men, do this, and, you know, he was really actually just kind of like complimenting what they were doing, he was kind of like going, yeah. You got it. You're cool. You know, you're you're doing the things of the Lord. You just keep on, keep on, on. You know, because John outlived the disciples. You know, he saw what was going on, and God blessed him. You know, to live a long, natural life. You know, which, in some ways, you know, I'm not so sure is a blessing. Maybe it was. Maybe it wasn't. But he got a chance to see the Lord. You know, in His glory, because he got a chance to be teleported, so to speak, unto the day of the Lord in the Book of Revelation. But 
John rejoiced more so in seeing that those of the faith were walking in truth. And you know, I like that about my family, you know. I hear these little reports and they're more important to me than if I showed up on a birthday or a holiday. They're more important to me when I hear that, you know, my sister has, you know, kind of popped out in the clear blue sky with some scripture or some word for somebody and encouraged them. You know, it's not an everyday thing, of course not. You know, it's not like they're doing, you know, a constant 24-hour thing, you know. But it's when those moments are right that God has used them in a unique and special way. And that's what God does with you. In a unique and special way, God uses you to touch someone else's life. To reach out and be, not as hands and feet, but to be an example of the living God in us. Because that's what Emmanuel means, God in us. It also means God with us. And it also, if you can receive this, means God for us. Now, it may be a little hard for you to understand why you were born. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. It might be hard for you to understand how God could have planned out you being either an accident like me or, you know, some purposeful design where they went out of their way, you know, to have a child, you know, and now they're overbearing, you know, your parents. But you were planned, not by how you were born, but by God who created you. You see, God knew how things would work out. And so he planned accordingly all the circumstances to work them out in his way that he wants it to accomplish his purpose, not the way that man sometimes tries to plan and do the things that he wants done. Oftentimes, people don't realize that, that God knows ahead of time everything that was going to happen. So he arranged all around those circumstances the ability to cause you to make the free will choice that you would to serve him and to seek him and to find him. Like today, whether you know it or not, today God has planned out your day. You can either discover it the hard way or you can learn about it the easy way. You could ask him, you know, well God, what do you got planned for today? Or you could just go about your way and find out he has planned out for you exactly what he wanted you to do. You know, before I even walked out here, I didn't even look at a devotional, you know. I walked out here and I said, you know, I just felt like God was telling me about God's planning. And sure enough, you know, I opened it up to the day that, you know, God wanted me to share, you know, from today's, you know, date. And it says, he has prepared for them a city. God's planning. Isn't that amazing how there's no coincidences with God? There's no accidents. There's no oops. You know, we messed around and we... we now we're having a baby. It's an accident. No, it isn't. It's God's planning. God cannot... You cannot have a child without God adding the increase. In other words, yes, you could put together all the right, you know, ramifications of the consequences of actions, meaning like you could participate with your sperm and someone else could participate with their egg, you know, meaning that, you know, you've had some kind of consensual sex, hopefully, and then suddenly, you know, there's a sperm and an egg, but you know, without God adding that extra spark, there may not be enough sperm. There may not be a right egg. It may not have a right environment to grow and become a living being. So without the third part, there is no life, as it were. God is that extra part, the creator of the universe. You get to participate with him in creation, not you created life. That's <laughs> so dumb. How silly is that? But when you participate with God, you discover that there's three parts to everything in life. There's God's part, human part, and spiritual part, or body, soul, and spirit, like you are. You know, I'm a, I'm a body, soul, and spirit. Now, there's a lot of people walking around that are kind of dead on the inside, and that's because they're not spiritually alive. They're dead spiritually, so they have to become born again. So they know that they're also a spirit. But when God designed the universe, he planned it all out from beginning to end and coordinated every single action to accomplish a purpose. And today, you can participate in that planning and that purpose that God has for you. Because you're not an accident. You're not interrupting God's will in some way and you're not screwing up God's plan. God's already 
got it accomplished. He sat down, he's done. As far as he's concerned, it's over with. You're perfect. You're going to get there. But how you get there is really up to you. You can do it the easy way or the hard way. And the angels are watching to see just how you're going to deal with today. So for me, I kind of like to go with the planning. I like to read the directions and the instructions that have been given to me for today. Because I like to go with what God might say as opposed to what people will tell me what to do before I've had a chance to check in with you know who to find out how I should live my life. Because I could tell my sisters, you know, like, be a dictated brother, you know, and say, well, you should live your life this way, you know, and tell them what to do. But I don't. I give them the freedom to make their own choices. You should, I might say, but after that, it's their choice. And I accept it. When my sister visited, she asked me, you know, well, something about what she should do about some folders I made a long time ago. Before there was ever a Chuck Smith Bible, I made a Chuck Smith Bible that was kind of neat, you know, and it was had some beautiful graphics and all this stuff, you know, a lot of labor went into it. But it was like a notebook Bible, just a bunch of notebooks with, you know, some commentary by Chuck and stuff, you know, and it was really beautiful because on the one hand was the Bible and the next, hand, next page was the commentary, you know, and you could kind of read it side by side. You know, it's kind of a beautiful idea. Forerunner of things that to come. And in those days it was good because people would walk in and they'd see the covers and they never read the notebooks, but they saw the covers, they saw, you know, something that inspired them. So God used it. Well, because it's outgrown its usefulness, she wanted to know what she should do with it. And I said, it's your library. You do it like you want. And so, you know, she needed to check with me to find out what I would give her permission to do. Well, it's her ministry to the Lord. She's ministering of the Lord to the people from the Lord. And so I told her, hey, it's you and God, not me. I don't have anything to do with it. And so she was blessed by that, even though she was a little shocked. You know, because the reality of each one of us, we stand alone with God. So every day of your life, alone with God, you need to find out what you and He would do today, as opposed to what other people might tell you to do in your life. He had prepared for them a city. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. An inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you. Here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. You know, it's interesting that people always tell me i got to do this. You know, people will tell me i got to vote. No, I don't. People will tell me that I have to participate in some, you know, civil action. I say, no, I don't. I have no connection with the land I live in. I'm passing through this land. It's an evil land to me. It's a corrupt land. It has corrupted officials that at best they can only do what they humble themselves to do before the Almighty God. And then God can still change their heart the direction that He wants them to go. But it's not my home. This is not where I belong. I have a home in heaven. I have a continuing city that will ever be shining bright in the heavens for me the New Jerusalem. I have a citizenship in heaven that has guaranteed me that I am no longer a part of this world in its ways. I've been removed from all the activities that the world has to offer me, and now I am just a stranger in a strange land passing through, no longer participating in those things that profit me little and actually accomplish nothing in the kingdom of God. But rather, I choose to bring forth light into the situation and circumstances where I'm at that I'm living in, that I might choose the opportunity to do what God tells me to do or don't do what men tell me to do. Before God, he'll stand or fall. So I choose to do what God tells me to. And since I've never voted in, I don't know, 35 years plus, a, plus as a Christian, I don't choose to vote now because I have asked God in each and every election, what do you want me to do? He says, pray. Okay. <laughs> So I'm happy with that. I don't waste time doing all the other things that people do, you know, getting all wrapped up and emotional about this guy or that guy or that thing or this thing, and you know, every two or three years having to change their minds about whatever it is that they were involved in at the time. Me, I just keep praying for each one that gets elected and pray that God uses them and blesses them and encourages them. And then when they're out of office, that God inspires them, you know, to turn to Him and to seek His face and to walk with Him in humility.
and sincerity and the truth. It's like I pray for you. This same Jesus which is taken from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waits for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until he receives the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient and establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draws nigh. Yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Jesus is coming again, and not in 2012. But Jesus could be coming for you any day now, because you could drop dead, or some consequence of some action around you may cause some stray bullet to hit you, or some gas line to erupt, or some weather circumstance to wipe you out. But in reality, if you know the Lord, these catastrophes are opportunities to recognize God just simply took you home. So whatever means he chooses to take you home, recognize that death is not the end. That no, you're not destroyed. It was something that God used to take you home. So a lot of times I don't understand a lot of people say, Oh God, you know, it's so miserable the Christian died. I miss him so much. I'm like, uh, not me, man. Uh, they got a chance to take a free ticket home, which I could get away with that. I'd like to go home too. So don't always look at what you think of as bad. It actually might be good for the person, though you may suffer some loss. Really, count the cost because the person is now in the presence of the Lord. And I think that's a greater thing than being in your presence currently. Death is not something to be feared. Death, where is thy sting, Jesus said, because he has removed the sting of death. And he has the keys of hell and death. And one day, death will be cast far away into the lake of fire, along with the devil and all his angels. So, our opportunity to recognize that Jesus is coming isn't something to fear and to say, oh no, it's the end of the world, but to look forward to it. It's the beginning of life, real life, because all this corruption is passing away and the evil thereof. And no matter how beautiful you think creation is, when God comes back to set up his kingdom on this earth, after we've kind of like, you know, made a short pit stop in heaven, he's going to show you what it's meant to be as opposed to what man has created it to be. Wait till he wipes out all this technology and all these kind of like man-made structures and puts creation out from under the curse to reveal how God would have blessed us for a thousand years, walking, talking, and participating with the living God in our presence. That's what I'm looking forward to.